Hello, my name is Vincent Salucci. I work for the TU Delft Library and I'm co-sponsor of this event. It's uh, with uh, our partner, uh, DUIS, the Delft Women in Science Network, uh, represented by Astrid Tall, who's gonna speak in a moment. Um, she brought my attention to this documentary uh, over the course of the past year. And uh, I've watched it a few times since. And so we collaborated to make it available to the TU Delft uh, community. And we think this is worth uh, discussing, uh, particularly at, at a STEM university. And so we started hatching plans about a year ago. Um, and uh, of course, Corona foiled them to some extent. We would love to have you all in the library and, and I owe Dewis and, and all the uh, women faculty uh, a, a party and events uh, in, the, in the library. So uh, hold me to that next year. Hopefully we can all get together there um, because I think um, it's worth celebrating International uh, Women and Girl, Girls Day of Science, uh, which was in February. And then also this is uh, Women's History Month uh, in March, and we had Internet, uh, Women's Day on the 8th. Uh, and so we've designed a program at the library uh, for women in science. Uh, with this is consisted of, excuse me, this is consisted of two online exhibitions. Uh, organi one organized in tandem with our heritage team on the history of uh, first year female students at TU Delft titled Novices, and then also I did one with the help of the Dewis Network and Astrid titled Voices of Women in Science, which features 17 current female researchers, um, and also um, it features their research and introducing them by their uh, intelligence and their intellectual endeavors, but also um, giving them words of a wisdom and sharing advice and mentoring to uh, further female students uh, and current students uh, to prevent this leaking pipeline uh, that we'll discuss uh, a little bit more here in a little bit. We also had a student pub quiz on the history of women in science and some diversity terms. We had a poetry club uh, speech featuring a, a, a fantastic female poet and she was reading uh, poems and the students wrote poems on the theme of equality. And we also wanted to plug um, some other collaborators. There's so many events uh, going on this month um, uh, regarding this theme, but NWO has an Inside Out program uh, that comes up on the 22nd. And so I wanted to plug that too. That said, I just want to welcome you here today and I'll turn it over to Astrid and Dewis and uh, our panels. So welcome everybody. I am, yeah, I'm very excited that we have 72 participants now, so uh, that's uh, wonderful that uh, many people are finding this topic important. Um, I'm coordinator of uh, DEWIS, Delft Women in Science. It's the women's network uh, of scientists uh, at TU Delft, and um, our mission is to um, help TU Delft to attract more women and create an inclusive safe environment that makes uh, yeah, women want to stay and to give them opportunity to grow and uh, yeah, flourish in their careers. And um, although yeah, diversity is an aspect of, uh, is about all as aspects in which people differ, the film and the discussion focuses on gender. And um, yeah, in the film, female scientists tell their story about their career path in academia and uh, the challenges they faced. And um, uh, the film aims to raise visibility around uh, yeah, critical issues of diversity, uh, equal equity and inclusion in science. And uh, so uh, I'm happy that all you are here uh, for the discussion and uh, about uh, how to make science more inclusive. Um, I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Valerie Garben, Val Valeria Garben, I hope I say it good. Um, Valeria Garben did her, uh, she did a master's in physics and uh, her, she did her PhD at 
the University of Trieste in Italy. She was a Rubicon Fellow in Physics of Fluids a group at the University of Twente and a postdoc uh, researcher at the University of Pennsylvania before starting her research group at I Imperial College London in 2012. Uh, she joined the Department of Chemical Engineering at TU Delft in 2019 as an associate professor. Um, Valeria has been awarded as a, uh, an ERC uh, starting grant, was the 2018 recipient of the McBain Medal and the 2020 recipient of the Soft Matter Lectureship. Uh, Valeria's expertise is in transport phenomena in soft and biological matter applied to biomedical flows, advanced materials, sustainable processes and products. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to have you, Valeria, and uh, thank you for being our moderator. Thank you, Astrid, for the um, introduction. Maybe I would like to uh, mention something uh, else about my, my experience. Uh, back in my seven years at Imperial College London, I was uh, on the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion uh, working group or, or, or committee of the college. And I've, I've had several interactions with uh, different uh, working groups that were uh, designing programs to uh, improve representation of women in different faculties and departments. And uh, I'm really excited now to take part into the initiatives that are going on here at uh, TU Delft. And that's why I got in touch with uh, uh, Astrid and Davis. And uh, when Astrid invited me to be the moderator for this um, event, I was really happy to do it. And then I watched the, the movie and I was even more excited to, to start a discussion on, on that topic. So um, Astrid and Vincent have assembled a fantastic uh, panel uh, with, with many of our colleagues um, that I'm going to introduce now. Uh, you see here the names of our panelists on the screen. Um, we have the pleasure of having David Kisson joining the panel. He is a, a Anthony van Leeuwenhoek Professor in Smart Products and Environments at the Faculty of Industrial Design Engineering. And uh, uh, in September 2020, he was appointed as Diversity Officer. Uh, if you want to know a bit about his research area, it is in sustainable living uh, and work with the aim to foster well being combined with energy and CO2 reduction in the built environment. Over the past decade, he has led multiple European and NVO projects and is active in the climate knowledge innovation community. Uh, but today we are going to um, really uh, ask you to wear your hat as our uh, diversity officer. And uh, you can expect some uh, uh, grilling from us, I think. Then we have um, Sam uh, Filebrief. Hello, Sam. Uh, Sam uh, is a master student in the um, in transport infrastructure and logistics. Uh, this year, he serves as full-time member of the Central Student Council on behalf of Leist Beta. And one of his portfolios uh, for this year is diversity and inclusion, uh, which uh, he thinks is a very important subject that deserves more attention at TU Delft and beyond. Welcome, Sam. We are very curious to hear um, your inputs. Uh, then the third panel member is uh, Elif Oskan Evieira. Uh, she is an associate professor of sound driven design and research at the Faculty of Industrial Design Engineering. She works in the field of sound driven design, uh, focusing on uh, medical innovation uh, to uh, focus on personal needs and uh, values such as pleasure, dignity, sense of achievement and mental health. She has worked with Toyota Motors Europe and the European Space Agency on the topic of designing human-centered alarms for complex systems. And she's currently partnered with Erasmus Medical Center Rotterdam to study the concept of the silent uh, intensive care unit. It is a, a very fascinating uh, topic. And we're uh, also curious to hear about your experiences as a woman uh, uh, academic. Uh, uh, next. 
uh, in our list is uh, Sofia uh, Luxo. Sofia is a professor, uh, smart energy systems in the faculty TPM and a uh, board member of Davis. Uh, she received her PhD uh, from the uh, Technical University of Eindhoven, the uh, Eindhoven University of Technology. And since 1995, she has been working at the Faculty of Technology Policy and Management here at UDELF. She is a full professor in the Energy and Industry Group, uh, concentrating on a wide range of problems uh, on uh, how complex social technical systems are functioning today and can be reshaped for the sustainable future. Uh, welcome, Sofia. And last but not least, we have uh, Laura Marchal Crespo, uh, who is an associate professor at the Department of Cognitive Robotics in the faculty uh, 3ME. She is also affiliated with the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Bern in Switzerland. Laura obtained her um, master and PhD degrees from the University of California at Irvine in the US, studying how robots and virtual reality can be employed to improve neuro rehabilitation. Welcome everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, kick off the discussion maybe um, by uh, asking Vincent if we can play a quick uh, opening clip from the, uh, from the documentary uh, film Picture a Scientist uh, on which our discussion will be based. If there are any technical hiccups, maybe I can already start asking some questions, Vincent. What do you say? I'm working on it. Are we seeing? We are ready for the clip. Thank you. Do we have sound? No sound. One moment. Let's do that one more time with the sound. When you ask somebody, draw a picture of a scientist, it used to be all men. We were just trying to be scientists. We certainly didn't want to be seen as troublemakers or activists. picture is that women are extraordinarily underrepresented in science. Uh -oh, I thought we might have a few buffering problems. <laughs> I think maybe we should use that as a, a cue to work on buffering the next clip. Okay, so um, I'm going to kick off with the uh, first uh, reactions uh, on, on this uh, film. Um, who is it going to be? Uh, Sophia, can I ask you uh, for your impressions? How did you uh, feel after watching the film and uh, did anything surprise you? Uh, thank you, Valeria. Uh, the, my first reaction after watching the film is that it made me very, very sad because you see this uh, so clearly that many women don't have sufficient chances to develop uh, themselves in the academic environment. And uh, at the same time, they don't uh, uh, receive a sufficient amount of respect for the things uh, they did. And this is, of course, a very, very sad news. By having this in mind, and I guess we will further on discuss this, I also made a short experiment. I asked uh, people with children from my bubble, ask your grandchildren or children to picture a scientist, but please don't say that I am asking this. And what was the answer? Many of the children give me a picture. I don't have it, but I can show to you. And women being a scientist. And I was 
discussing this with uh, them later on. And I guess because they see me, professor, sometimes you talk about this, so they have a role model. And you see that this is influencing enormously. So in main bubble, I get more pictures with a woman as a scientist. And that was very, very ho 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 hopeful for me and uh, maybe to all of us. So it is from one side and very, very sad film. But if you look maybe further and discuss with others, it can, it can uh, give us sufficient hope that in the future, this time of films are totally not needed. That is my reaction. Thank you, Sofia. I, I find it very um, yeah, encouraging, the, the result of this experiment that you reported. It also tells us that the initiatives aimed at just increasing representation of underrepresented groups does have the um, effect that we hope to yeah. uh, improve the, um, well, not improve, but to, to make it visible to, 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 to change the some. next generation that uh, it is possible. Um, can I just pass the mic on to um, maybe Laura? Can I share my feelings also with uh, Sofia? Uh, the movie also made me feel very sad, uh, but at the same time it made me feel um, with hope uh, because what I witnessed uh, was three women that succeed into fighting the system. And yeah, it was a lot of work. Um, sometimes they were asking themselves if it was a waste of time, but uh, as a result, it was a better world. So a better world for future generation of female researchers uh, who want to join this career. Somehow also I was wondering myself if maybe the film was very negative in the sense that it was making us very sad. And if somehow by presenting this very negative uh, vision of research also is gonna prevent uh, young female researchers to join us, uh, that this is actually what we want, right? We want more female into the research. And now one of the main reasons I wanted to join this panel is because um, actually I'm, I feel so happy and this work uh, makes me so fulfilled, right? So, um, so also to show that there is also a female researcher who really enjoy this. We also encounter struggles, um, but actually the joys uh, overpass <laughs> the challenges. And because previous women that have been in the situations of pain and sadness uh, fight so far, uh, so much, uh, now we are preparing a better world uh, for future generations. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, Elif, can we have your opinion uh, or your impressions? How did you feel after watching this movie? Yeah, um, I recognize many of the things that uh, uh, these female scientists uh, talked about. So I shared the sentiment of being sad, but I also felt nauseated to the fact that um, these things had to happen. And especially the, the situation of uh, Jane Willenbring and when uh, her colleague seeing all the harassment being done, but not recognizing this as harassment, <laughs> I thought that's something that we really have to work on. We need ambassadors uh, for you know, diversity in science. Uh, we need to um, have these discussions. So thank you for Astrid and Vincent for organizing such debates. And we need awareness about these topics. We need to recognize the problem uh, and act on it. It's not about bravery, but it is really correcting the situation. And very often people don't have the courage or they uh, just don't see it because they are not sensitive uh, enough. Um, so for me, that was the most impressive thing to do, that uh, when a woman or someone being harassed to such a degree and not being recognized uh, just because the woman was trying to be strong uh, is not an excuse. So I think we have to work on that. Uh, thank you, uh, Elif. Uh, Sam, can I ask you to comment on um, how this uh, film made you feel and if anything maybe was surprising to you 
Yes. Um, good that you used the word surprising because I think there were some things like I've also heard of, of these big cases, of course, uh, like the top of the iceberg, as I mentioned in the movie. But the bottom of the iceberg was really what, what kind of surprised me because it's there's so many little things and so many things that you can do also unintentionally that lead to this very structural way of, of mistreating women in science. And I was like, wow, I really you really have to start thinking about this actively. That there's all these little things. Um, which you have to watch out for, which can happen uh, also if you don't intend it. But there's also a lot of people who do do it intentionally. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a woman, nor am I in science yet. Um, so for me, it's kind of looking at it from the outside. Um, and I really try hard to, you know, recognize these things and not, not do them myself. And I would hope if I were in a situation where I go to Antarctica, um, a lot like happened to Jane, that you would recognize that. But also the little things are very hard to recognize. Um, and I see there's a very structural problem um, that must be addressed also as, as uh, what's her name, Nancy Hopkins, I think, at, at MIT showed that there's like, like she actually calculated what the difference was in floor space. And I was, I was amazed that it was that big. Like you kind of expected, you know, that there's this difference because for some reason that happens, but that it's so big and so structural between men and women, that was really surprising to me. Um, and I'm always, I always get really upset when people don't react to that positively. So you have the director there who just said, you know, I'm not going to look at this. Um, and that's the kind of reaction that you really don't need. At least always listen and try to see what the problems are and recognize that they're there and not just swipe them away because you don't think it's a problem or don't care. Um, so I think, yeah, there's definitely still a lot to, to do um, before you really get to the equality that you want. Yeah, those were my initial thoughts. Thank you, Sam. And yeah, quite interesting that you mentioned this kind of symbolic example of lab space that, of course, applies to a range of other uh, opportunities like sa um, salary gap and, and other uh, things. David, your turn. Yeah, I think I think there's for me, what's really interesting was MIT has some parallels with the Tate Delft as a technical university. Um, and what I found uh, inspiring was also the approach that Nancy uh, Hopkins took of really, uh, like Sam mentioned, making calculations and coming up with data. Uh, that's something we're working on now. We'll have a very shortly uh, a portal online for the whole world to see where you can see all the faculties and the cross functions, number of women. And I think at technical university, I think data really helps people create awareness and understanding. And I know there's a lot of other issues at hand that I, beyond the sheer numbers uh, about um, latent discrimination and uh, sexual harassment, a lot of factors, which I found familiar in the film. Um, but I, I do think uh, in a scientific community like the Tehu Delft, um, we can also take a somewhat scientific approach to changing some of the culture and attitudes. And also um, I think really it's about organizational change and it's really about creating systematic change. So really bringing um, um, organizations like Davis into the main body of the Tehu Delft and really making it mainstream. Um, and it just becomes a natural way of working. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I think now we, we, we could potentially watch another short clip to further uh, foster the discussion. Um, yes, it's coming. I'm sure we're, we've all been in enough online lectures and online conferences to know that these small glitches <laughs> happen and are part of the sexual harassment. What's gotten most of the attention is unwanted sexual attention, coercion. Those are in the public eye, and I think everyone would agree we absolutely need to address those. And then you have all the stuff that's underneath. Those are actually more than 90% of the sexual harassment. You know, the subtle exclusions, being left off an email, not being invited to a collaboration where you're the clear expert, just these little moments that make a woman feel like she doesn't belong. That's a really common experience. Looks like the technology is determining the length of the clip today. <laughs> Working, working fine. That was a, a perfectly good time to stop. 
so um, yes, uh, we have all these um, extremely visible uh, uh, events that everybody is very aware of and, and very careful uh, to handle. And then we have all these invisible, uh, huge variety of small uh, actions or lacks of actions that can have overall taken together uh, still a very big effect on the representation, not only of um, women, of course, but also other um, underrepresented groups that we will, uh, that topic we will touch upon um, a bit later. Um, does one of the um, female professors in the panel want to kick off uh, some discussion on uh, the, um, the hidden part of the iceberg, maybe sharing an experience or sharing some, some tips for colleagues? Sophia, floor yeah. is yours. Maybe I can share my experience. All the time I was thinking about my, myself that the gender issue don't play any role in my behavior. I, so I try to uh, be of, uh, be of uh, give equal opportunity to everybody. And maybe it is interesting also to mention that in my group, I am head of the group with four professors, three of them are female. We have a lot of female assistant associate professors, so you know, with different nationalities, you can say everything uh, is going perfectly there. The perfect group to be used as an example of diversity of the university. But I prepared an application text for the new professor by me in the group, and it is normally going through a screen if the text is uh, women friendly and I get it back, it was written by me and I get it back. It was not, uh, uh, not uh, um, adequately uh, of no, no, not uh, formulated in such a way that, uh, that we can expect that the women will react on it. And you see, it was for me very, very clear. We very often think that we act properly by we actually don't do this. We have a clear bias. Also, those who are, you know, really with warm heart for the diversity. So that is, I will say, the message, message to everybody. Be really aware it is not so easy as maybe it looks like. How to change this? I don't know. I don't have a clear recipe, but I think we need all together work on the cultural change, maybe having uh, workshops or the uh, exercises how to, to, to becoming aware about your own shortcomings and how to change the culture. David said that his uh, objective is to uh, change the culture of the university, the scientific approach for changing the culture. It sounds very, very good, but I also know that changing a culture that is a process of many, many years sometimes 40, 50, 100 years, we need to change the culture. So we need to be prepared that the process is a long-term process by, I guess, step by step, we can get there where we would like to be. And be aware about your own habits, I will say. Thank you, Sofia. This is a, a very, very interesting point about uh, our own biases uh, towards each other that we will uh, actually go back uh, to later because we have another clip on, on exactly that from the film. Um, I would also like to hear um, Laura's uh, uh, input on um, the hidden part of the iceberg, let's say. Yeah, so when I watched the movie and I saw this hidden part of the iceberg, um, I think that I could check, put a tick in all of the things that were lower of the water. Um, so this is not the first time I saw this, um, but um, it was uh, shown to me by somebody else uh, when I encountered problems in my career. So this is something that 
is actually hidden to ourselves. And actually somehow you deny that it exists. I don't know if it's a way of surviving or, or what, but somehow you deny uh, the existence. So I find really good uh, that the film brought it so that you could see clearly it's in there. And yeah, don't look <laughs> somewhere else uh, because once you recognize there is a problem, then and do you, you know where is the problem, then it's the only the situation where you can somehow solve the problem, right? Uh, first recognize and, and then trying to tackle it. So it, it was uh, my, fil uh, my female colleagues, the ones who drew me uh, to this conclusion of it exists, right? Uh, it's not in your imagination, it's a reality. So. Yes, Elif. Um, I totally recognize what Laura is saying. Uh, this uh, Maybe it's so systemic that sometimes I don't know if something is just happening to me or is it me because I'm a woman or, you know, um, and I think especially we, people in power positions, uh, they play this card so well that uh, it often looks like uh, this would have been the same decision for someone else too, for a male, uh, you know, uh, researcher as well. So I find it very, very difficult to identify when is it a female issue and when is it something personal that you are not actually there yet, you know, as a scientist. So, so that's something that we can all uh, expect that maybe we don't get the grant because uh, uh, we haven't uh, written something that's so compelling. But sometimes you don't know if it is because you're female or if it is. So it's very, um, I think one of the solutions might be is to have uh, these people in power positions to be completely sensitive to these issues. Like what uh, Sophia was saying that, uh, of course, she's aware of it and it still is very difficult <laughs> to do the right thing. So what do we do? Do we train uh, or do we... Uh, have um, I know that there were like harassment uh, trainings for all the associate and uh, full professors in our university, but it just happened once after I think Me Too movement and that was it. So the issue is not covered just because you sweeped one uh, uh, in one moment of time a couple of professors they got the lecture and then they immediately become. Uh, uh, very politically correct, right? Uh, so, um, so I would like to see better management, you know, uh, that people are who are actually, as I said, ambassadors to these issues. But I also have something good. Can I can I mention that too? <laughs> so I finished the course, first year course. I'm talking about students who are about eighteen years old, and uh, I got two emails from one male, one female student reflecting on the diversity of uh, the team that I had. Uh, so there are a series of lectures and uh, they wanted to see more diversity in those, uh, amongst those lecturers. And I explained that, you know, um, the whole course is actually, I, I, I uh, worked really hard like Sophia to make sure the team is 50% male or female, then we have uh, 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 colleagues that identify themselves as gay within the community, we have uh, uh, people from different ethnicities, from Asia, from uh, Turkey, from Portugal, so I was trying to explain, but they said, but they're all very hidden, we want the, the lecturers who are really in the spotlight to be females of different ethnicity because we want to be encouraged we want to identify ourselves within that uh, community that we want to have these role models and i thought i think the future generation is quite aware of these uh, situations and i think they will do a lot for us and uh, at the age of 18 when you demand this imagine what you can do as a you know full professor <laughs> or and along the way so um, that email was one of the best emails I have ever received from anyone. So <laughs> wanted to share the, the awareness as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing this very uplifting uh, um, experience. Um, 
Ah, so thank you for posting questions in the chat. Keep them coming. I will uh, um, uh, ask them in, in the appropriate times in the conversation. If you have questions, you can post them. And if you want to ask them in person to the panelists, you can also make a note of that. And I will give you the mic. Um, first, I want to wrap up on this topic. I just want to ask um, um, to, to follow up with David on the topic of, yes, we can have these trainings on, on big issues like harassment. That is something that we all recognize, we all are aware is a big problem and we can have a one-off training for all new staff and say, this is how it looks like and these are the things that need to be done. But how about all these um, invisible actions or lack of action, like not giving equal opportunity in a way that is not very obvious not giving the same level of visibility to male and female colleagues or group members or students. How can we, um, how can we take actions to change the culture at that uh, submerged level of the iceberg? Yeah, I, I think, I think well, there's a lot of, <laughs> I can probably talk an hour on this subject, but um, I think one of the things we have to change, um, it's really important is the view on diversity and I think some people think it's something we have to do because, of course, society is diverse and uh, we have also um, the, uh, not only white people in the society, not only males and et cetera, and not only certain people with certain orientations or, or limitations, whatever. But it's also about creating more power. And I mean, there's a lot of um, research on this also in companies and industry and that by having more diverse teams, you're able to increase the power and the the, the academic quality and productivity, whatever, uh, of the group. And it's also about creating more science, uh, really looking at gendered innovations. And so really understanding what, what understanding what gender means for our innovation and for our creativity. And I think, I think one way we can change some of these uh, underlying latent kind of discriminatory views and on, on is educating people about the value of diversity and not just something you have to do. No, it's good for your own science. It's good for you as a researcher. And I, I think if we can get that message across through diverse activities, efforts, will come a long ways. I just wanted to pick up on the question in the chat about quotas. I think a really nice example is Erasmus University. Two years ago, they had 14% female professors. It's not published yet, but they're now at 25% in two years. They have a, um, they've invested 3 million uh, euro per, uh, budget for their DNI team at the university there. And they put a lot of effort into awareness, campaigning without quotas. And they've really changed the numbers, at least on that level. Uh, we have to do a lot also on our university, not only on the uh, professor level, also on the associate professor level. We have very few associate professors on campus, uh, very few. Um, I think we have like 37 total on the whole campus. So it's not only about the professors, but also, but I do think you can see within a short amount of time, uh, at least in Erasmus, they were really able to change some of the figures and numbers uh, and, and, and really create meaningful change by promoting uh, excellent um, women in science. But it also means we have to take care of our uh, associate professor pool because if that's too small, we can't promote the full professor either. So it's looking at the whole chain. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of things we can do to change uh, attitudes and culture, but I, I really wanna to try to push the positive in, in short. Um, but can we can we also have Sam's opinion on this, and then we will we'll, yes, Sofia, we will uh, get to you in yeah. a moment. Let, let's I will hear be Sam. A little bit happy to react on the quota because okay. time ago I was asked to uh, uh, advise uh, our board of the university regarding the quota for the female professors at the university and. Uh, I was uh, requested to give such an advice because I am, as you know, the board member of Davis. And it was not so easy exercise uh, to me because actually I was expected to give a number and I am against a number and the same maybe way as David you, I proposed not to give numbers, maybe the numbers that will be the uh, outcome of the uh, answer we would like to have to, uh, to, to be best in class. So I think we as a university should be best in class regarding the diversity, gender and related issue. If we will 
formulated this as an um, objective to us, it will be easier to go to the numbers. By what happens, actually, we are requested to give reasonable numbers. Finally, we ended with 15%. That is only for the female professor. For me, that was actually worst in class answer. So if we would like to change the societies, would like to uh, change our university, our groups, I will say, we need to get in mind of all of us that we would like to be best in class. And if we can do this, and maybe in a similar way, as it happened in the university in Rotterdam at Erasmus, we'll get more and more numbers. By the goal is not having 15% and not 17%. The goal should be, we would like to be best in class. And I hope, David, you are behind me with this. Of, uh, uh, not behind before me, of course. Yeah, sorry by that we are together for being best in class among technical universities in the Netherlands. Yeah, so just to briefly what we're doing now, we're putting together a diversity board and there'll be at every faculty a diversity officer and also Davis will be in the board and True You and other organizations, student council. So we're, we're getting that going. Um, the letters are going out now. Um, and I've spoken to all the deans. We have a lot of support from all the faculties for this. So we're creating a very strong, I think, team where we can get a lot more done than we did in the past. That all sounds great. Uh, thank you, Sophia, for mentioning the um, uh, the concept of best in class and highlighting the fact that setting a certain quota or number can be perceived as compromising on, on something when it doesn't have to be that way at all. So before we move on to uh, another topic, and we, we also start addressing all the, the many questions that are uh, coming in from the chat, um, I wanted to give some an opportunity to comment on the hidden part of the iceberg because that was actually one of the things you mentioned in your opening statement that there are a lot of things that people are not really aware of that can actually cause uh, exclusion or a, um, disadvantage. Yeah, the one thing I want to react on is what David said is about education. I think there's a large role also in teaching people about it, like in our actual education at TU Delft, but also above that. Um, in my bachelor's, I had a course called IT and Values, where one of the lectures was actually about, you know, diversity in, in, in teams and how that leads to, like David explained, uh, a better team and a better result. And the reaction was really kind of mellow in the classroom. I mean, it's computer science, so there's a lot of computer scientists and, and they tend to react a bit mad to that. But I was like, wow, people actually need to be told this, that diversity is not just, you know, some something that we find important because we say it no it actually leads to better results in your end product you actually need to have a diverse team to you know take everything into account and i think that's really what people at TU Delft react to as soon as you talk about science as soon as you talk about numbers you show them like this 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 has an effect this isn't just something we want this actually is better for the science itself and i think that's something we could do a lot more with within education as well to show students uh, who are a bit more critical because of course there's lots of students uh, like the one who mailed you, Elif, like they care and they understand. But there's also a lot of students who don't see the problems yet. And that's also the bottom of the iceberg again. People don't, like a lot of people don't realize this is a thing. Uh, who may also want to realize it, who are not open to, you know, getting criticism. Because we all make these mistakes, but we have to be open to the criticism we get and then try to improve on it. And I think the only way to do that is to teach people and to, to ad keep addressing these issues. Um, and I think there's a large role for that in science education as well. Thank you, Sam. I think there is a, uh, a topic that is emerging from different questions uh, in the chat regarding uh, the increase in percentage of women, number of women, representation of women uh, beyond just uh, the, the topic of quotes, which we already started discussing. There are questions about, is it sufficiently in increase the number? Uh, high numbers increase diversity, but not, not necessarily inclusion especially if these higher numbers are not in uh, high positions. It also doesn't address the toxic work environment and doesn't mean that women or minorities in general will, um, will be retained. So um, 
the, there are many other questions coming in that we will uh, address uh, next. I would I would just like to maybe spend a few minutes with the with the panelists discussing what is a, a holistic approach to not only increasing numbers but also uh, changing the culture. At the same time, we've already heard some um, uh, initiatives from from David. Can I can I get some? Uh, opinions maybe uh, from uh, Elif, would you like to start? The how to s systemically change the culture, is that the, is that the question, Valeria? Yeah, so th there are a number of, of questions and comments in the chat that um, discuss from different angles the effect of increasing numbers. Yeah. Is it sufficient? Do we need to do something else? Increasing numbers will not be a long-term effect if there is no support, et cetera. Yeah, one of the things about this increasing numbers that I am worried about, and when I talk to sometimes uh, female professors, they identify themselves as being part of the, the, the boys club. And they act like the boys club, <laughs> you know, that, and, and I don't think that should also be the culture that we should be, you know, cultivating or the kind of the behavior that we should be cultivating that um, uh, if the success happens because you acted like a man in order to get to a certain position where normally men go, I think that is wrong. <laughs> so maybe we could be embracing these female qualities. One of the things that I found surprising and also beautiful in the movie, these strong female scientists there, they dare to cry, they show their vulnerabilities, and they rise above it, you know, and I think um, what Sam was saying, all these simple things, little things, but maybe reflecting and acting on the and avoiding or punishing the good, good bad behavior or avoiding the, the good one, uh, will help us uh, you know, uh, change the culture. Uh, if we don't act in the moment, I have many regrets that I didn't act in the moment. And this movie kind of created this uh, PTSD kind of reaction that why didn't I do this? I, it is important, we should. And some of the the, 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 the viewers are, or the audience is also saying we should have more, uh, we shouldn't be mellow, we should be, you know, strong about this. So, um, and I think it's really culture, it all comes down, boils down to the, the, to the fact that in our daily interactions, we really have to change our behavior and uh, we, we need to appreciate the good ones and highlight it and make it explicit in publicly. And, and I think uh, uh, kind of uh, correct the, the, the other ones. So I wouldn't want female scientists to come to the top and act like one of the boys and then, you know, create a toxic uh, <laughs> kind of environment for us. So that, that would be uh, some of the fears that uh, I would have. Uh, and that's why I would like to embrace femininity and the qualities that come with it and make it also normal. You know, if I'm a mother, if I am, I mean, look at MIT that, uh, uh, the female scientists were going away because there were no childcare facilities in the in the campus. And now in Tel Aviv we have it and it's so beautiful. I felt so comfortable in those moments when I had my baby just two minutes away from my faculty. So, um, uh, yeah, just embrace the femininity and what it what comes with it and just, uh, you know, uh, 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 award the woman to come to the top with those qualities. So, um, yeah. Uh, thank you. I would like to interrupt the ongoing discussion for a moment to uh, ask a very important question that has been posted in the chat uh, for uh, uh, David. There is a specific practical question about if a student happens to be the victim of uh, sexual harassment at UDELF, where can they address the situation? and what help will they receive from the university? How well prepared is UDELF to help students? Maybe if we can uh, provide this information to our students uh, now, that, that can help somebody in, need in the future. Yeah, so um, 
we are we are adding now to also to the um, uh, it's already on the integrity uh, integrity office website. There's already like a, a list of resources, and we'll also put those on the um, the um, diversity and inclusion part of the of the website. But there's some of the same, same support resources that we have. There are there are resources at the TU Delft uh, counseling and, and different resources available to to students. But it's not well communicated, so it's now at least on the uh, integrity part of the website. And we'll add it to the DNI website very shortly. We'll at least, at least we'll link back to that. So uh, that's a problem in, in the communication. I think it's not adequate right now. The available resources. Um, it's um, we we take it very of course uh, very seriously, and it's it's a, it's a tough issue to deal with because um, you have to deal with uh, privacy aspects and things like that. And often people want to be, be stay anonymous, so it's hard to, and they don't want to say who it was. So it's it's hard to deal with it. But what we also want to do is run. Um, we're planning to run. Um, we have now a, a diversity coordinator who also joined the team, which is helping us. Uh, we want to run inclusiveness surveys for students, also for staff on campus, to get more insights in where are these problems, uh, in particular, which which maybe also which faculties is more of an issue than other faculties. Where is it, or even at department level? So we we need also more um, data to create uh, a better plan of intervention. So we're actually missing facts right now as well. That's a big problem. There hasn't been much data collected, actually, as far as I can find over the last couple of years, I don't think there's been any properly inclusiveness surveys done on, on campus. And so if I compare us to other universities, we're really behind on that. Um, so yeah, so it's it's um, um, yeah, an important point. The diversity office itself is not set up to provide uh, counseling services as our other, that's why we link to other services on campus. Uh, but we we are here to create uh, training program helps set up pro programs training programs working with outside doing monitoring and and developing uh, policy. Um, so an important in terms of this this uh, panel discussion important thing which we are also working on is a gender equality plan. We're required to have that ready for the EU and also NVO uh, subsidies will also be questing in the future more uh, diverse teams to get funding. Um, and if we don't have our GEP plan uh, ready in a year, we, we stand to lose 50 million uh, euro as a university on funding from Horizon. So there's a lot of uh, also financial pressure, which is good to, uh, to work on that. And for each faculty, we should also have a, uh, uh, a gender equality plan. And part of that plan will also be dealing with issues uh, relating to uh, uh, discrimination, how we handle those within the faculty themselves. So each faculty should have their also their own uh, uh, plan of approach to also uh, managing these. And there should be like um, a person within the faculty who is uh, objective and not um, not biased in any way who, who people could comfortably in a secure way talk with. This is, this is great to hear that there are all these initiatives. So if I can uh, uh, summarize the, the answer to the first question is, that was, if a student is the victim of sexual harassment, will they receive support at UDELFT? The answer is yes, they will. And there is a process that is being developed to make that uh, uh, an anonymous process where the identity is not uh, revealed and uh, uh, the information will be more easily available to students. Did I misrepresent in any way what you said? That's right. So if you look now on the uh, integrity office uh, web part of the website, you'll find there the links to different uh, services because also social integrity kind of relates back to DNI. So they're already we're making those more available. Uh, so it's the communication department uh, is working on this right now. This very item, making sure that all the links and available resources are well communicated on on the website, so students and staff can easily find those uh, that information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sam, would you like to add something with the regards to uh, support for students who may have experienced sexual harassment, or are not sure if they have received sexual harassment and they would like to know if their situa uncomfortable situation in which they have been uh, is indeed harassment. Uh, I don't have anything specific to add, but I hope indeed, like they've said, the TU Delft has a proper uh, places where you can report this. Uh, I know it's indeed not always the best and also hard to find in communication, um, but we work like very hard at the Student Council to improve communication around all of these things um, to know so people know where to reach out. And I think also as the diversity board develops and we start analyzing specific faculties that will also create more uh, you know, awareness of this and more points to reach out. Um, but indeed, it's uh, communication is usually what the, what the problem is. 
usually there is is plenty of support. Yeah, but now we I have a link in the chat. I had a link. David, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So there are lots of questions uh, in the chat. This is a, a fantastic. We uh, don't have enough time to address all these, uh, but our panelists can also see them and maybe get back to uh, individuals with more specific questions. Um, there are many topics from, from the film on which uh, we could continue, uh, but there is one very uh, provocative question in the chat that uh, those of us who are involved in recruitment will have heard in many ways and forms. And I would like to pick up on this. Um, a question to all panel, please, from Nakisa. Giving a position to a female candidate uh, that has a low quality profile and everybody says she got the position because she's a woman. Do you think it can be helpful for empowering women at the end? And uh, uh, the question is general for any positions in academia or industry. I think this also relates to the point that Sofia made earlier about um, uh, moving away from quotas and towards an ex standard of, of excellence that will naturally include more women. So on this, um, I would like to pass the hot potato on to Laura. <laughs> yeah, I love so, these kind of questions uh, because did they always- she get hired because she is a woman? <laughs> it's, it, it's presented as a dichotomy, right? So it's like, uh, you know, like you cannot fill a position with a woman because they are worse than male, than male by default. I mean, really it's like, is it really having quota is going to lower the quality of the person that uh, you are hiring? I mean, by asking this question, you are supposing that there are no women with the capability of fulfill that job. Uh, and that's, from my point of view, not true. I mean, I have been working with brilliant women all my life. So, and for this specific question, um, I would also like to come back to the to the, to the film that we watch, right? And there was an, a specific part where it was shown that women are perceived as being less qualified than men. So is the perception of this woman, it's lower qualified than the men because the woman is really lower qualified or it's because it's perceived by the others as not having the capabilities. So this is a, a complex problem. Right, so it seems like we women will always be perceived as not having the capabilities or not having the level, right? Um, and how this will affect the women. I mean, I am higher because I'm good. <laughs> and I don't think that I'm higher because I'm a woman. And if I am higher because I am a woman, I was better than all the other women, <laughs> women right? So yeah, it doesn't make me feel any worse. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a little bit sick of this, uh, of these questions uh, about, you know, you hire a woman and it's not, yeah, it has not the capabilities. I mean, yeah, I find this very paternalistic somehow too. Yeah, thank you, Lara. I've posted in the chat a link to the research paper uh, reporting the uh, findings described in the, in the film where two blind stud, uh, study groups received the same CV, one with a female name and one with a male, male of a male applicant, and the evaluation of the two identical CVs was completely different as a result of um, gender bias. Um, there are more questions. Um, and uh, a very active discussion here in the chat. Um, I would just like to maybe go back to one of the very interesting, uh, for me, very interesting points in the film where we have this social science experiment where the um, female professor herself admits to not passing the gender bias test and having this hardwired or maybe softwired bias for certain keywords to fit with a man or, or a woman that takes just those few milliseconds more to, to, to remove. Um, this is of course a uh, yeah, very, very difficult topic. Sophia has already shared her experience of uh, 
writing a job advert that turned out to be slightly uh, biased towards a more uh, male audience. Uh, can I maybe hear the experience of our other panelists? Elif or Laura, do you want to share something? Or Elif? Um, what I always think is that uh, we have that bias because we don't know a world in which, you know, there's this total equality. <laughs> so uh, whatever we do until we get to that 50% uh, of our scientific uh, community is, uh, uh, I don't know if it is 50, they also talk about 30 to 70, you know, uh, in, in the diversity, at least more than 30% of uh, of a community has to be from one group and, and 70 from the other. But we don't know how it is to be under woman leadership. As I said, that if this woman leadership were uh, emulating men, we still don't know what it is like to be actually very sensitive to women's issues. So uh, I, I really think that, um, um, I think it was Sophia who said, we need another hundred years to, <laughs> to change the, the total culture. But it is it is difficult, uh, and that's why we have to have more female people, but female who are really ready to uh, to act like being a female leader. Uh, I think Maria, uh, one of the the participants, is uh, working also quite hard on uh, training women uh, to be, you know, <laughs> better scientists and better managers and better leaders in the, in the scientific, uh, community. So, um, yeah, it, it is that what we just, um, all these biases happen because we haven't seen anything else. And, uh, I'm, I have three daughters, I'm raising them. I say, you're going to be, one of them wants to be an artist. Sure. And uh, you're going to be an architect, perhaps. The other one is going to be a scientist because she loves all kinds of facts and she wants to discover. And the, the young one, she just wants to disassemble things and she wants to build things and she's going to be an engineer. They don't even know actually what an engineer is, but the word is er in everyday conversation that we read books, she's going to be an engineer and the other one is a scientist and there's an artist. There's this diversity that, uh, you know, on, on, just the way we grow up, I think the languages that we use, the toys that we offer, or the movies that we watch, they all have an effect on how uh, we can avoid this, uh, uh, I think, gender bias. Thank you, uh, Elif. Sophia, do you, do you want to add something? Yeah, maybe because it, it sounds so negative when I I'm talking about the cultural change that we need to wait 100 years. That is not what I have in mind, but I guess we need to, to realize that the problem is complex. That is not only changing the academic environment, but also changing uh, actually the whole society. You need to change society, university, and, and your own groups. And I guess a year ago, there was a report uh, published by our uh, CBS uh, Statistic Office when they showed the different future perspectives of uh, high school students, pupils, and there was a significant difference about the future, uh, which is uh, sketched by uh, girls and boys. So they think in a very, very young age already differently about the future, about the career, about the possibilities. Uh, and uh, if you will go further, that is also applicable and different future view by our students. Also in the same uh, report of CBS, we see that the students think female and men differently about the future. So it is not only about changing a number of professor of assistant professors at the university, it is really about the changing the culture. And I like the comment of Sam very, very much. I guess we need, everybody actually needs to understand that diversity uh, gives us added value. We all become better and better. And it is not so easy to say what we need to do 
of course, maybe the, the examples, maybe different um, teaching materials, different teachers giving the lectures, everything uh, helps. By it is a very, very, very complex. And I was maybe also thinking about the, uh, I guess, my first International Women's Day at the Delft University, that was in 95. And I was asked to give my observation about the diversity and gender issue. That was the time that I was assistant professor here. And when I look at the presentation, I can give exactly the same presentation now in year 2021. Only a little bit of the numbers are changed, but actually the whole subject is exactly the same. And uh, for me, that is the, the, the uh, yeah, and my, maybe now that the acceleration is bigger than in the past and the awareness of uh, needs to change is bigger, but we still are in the process of changing culture. So I will say we need to do a lot and we need, I will say in the first instance, remove all obstacles maybe we created at the university so that the women and others uh, don't feel that they have the obstacle of the career path that should be uh, our um, pri primate goal, that the first step we need to do. And the rest, step by step, create, creating awareness and going in the good direction. But I am afraid it can't change in, you know, very, very short uh, uh, notice because it is the change of the whole society is needed. Thank you, Sofia. Um, so there is another theme that is um, emerging from, from the chat messages about, we need to encourage more um, girls to go into scientific topics already from uh, high school. However, we also know from the figures that the percentage of female students at the undergraduate level is uh, not uh, as low as the percentage going up the pipeline. So uh, I'm not disagreeing with that point, uh, but it's, it's not the only problem. There are problems also further down the line that maybe are not directly linked to that. And yes, I would like to hear Sam on this yeah. point. Uh, it's great that you bring this up because we're actually working on this currently with the Student Council. We've talked to communications about this, uh, about the high school outreach. So TU Delft is very local in their high school outreach. They go to high schools that TU Delft already goes to, that a lot of people from that school go to TU Delft. And they don't go as much to, you know, uh, high schools in the countryside, high schools in what you would call bad neighborhoods, things like that, to get a more diverse student body. Um, so that's something we're going to try to work on with communication and the executive board to bring that back, because they used to have that in the past. They used to have a specific person to um, a specific uh, full-time equivalent to find you know, more diverse uh, student bodies. And I think that's a, a good step, again, to further diversify the, the student body that we have. Also on the leaky pipeline uh, statistic, I actually look, we, as, as employees, we have this website where we can see a lot of statistics um, about the division at TU Delft. And at TU Delft, at least from what I could see on the, the broad statistics, there isn't much of a leaky pipeline here. It seems that it really is very stable with the amount of women between bachelor's, master's and a PhD and I was really surprised to hear that because it's such a well-known phenomenon that that happens and therefore I was wondering whether that's it just looks like that and there is a very much a leaky pipeline but also a large inflow or whether TU Delft is actually handling this well um, but I was really surprised to see that the numbers were so so straightforward here. Maybe David can comment on the numbers after PhD. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, actually, yeah, it's interesting. It's quite, it's quite okay. It, it could be better, but 50% of the female PA, say of the, of the staff continuing with the postdoc, 50% are female and 50% are male. So it's, so it means if, if we can avoid the leaky pipeline over time, things will look better. Um, but I mean, actually what we'd like to see is maybe, you know, 70% female, right? 30% male to even make the shift stronger, but it's not negative. So uh, in that sense, if you look at the the step from, let's say from PhD to joining the university, it's quite positive actually. 
So I think we're doing a, a, a good job there in ensuring that our current PhDs have equal opportunity to pursue uh, a career path uh, in the university, regardless of the gender. And if um, this, it also occurred to me that I think uh, it's a moment when you finish your PhD, uh, you want to concentrate on your family, perhaps. So this timing of the, the, the things and your academic uh, career path, I think, the, the, I mean, the timing of your personal life and your professional life, sometimes it uh, collides and um, uh, very often women are discouraged to continue uh, working full time or, you know, uh, or do some uh, very arduous work because like lack of care, um, um, uh, child care facilities or, you know, uh, facing difficulties uh, in pregnancy or, or, or looking after a family. So um, I think we should we could also look into this um, uh, contextual factors, not just only being in the academia, but what also happens uh, uh, in the private and, and, and professional lives of uh, women and how we can support this. For example, NWO, they give 18 months extra uh, for each female, uh, or I think they also want to do it for fathers, but um, uh, so you, you get an allowance of one and a half years to compensate for the time that you may be away, you may have been away from uh, scientific work. So um, such initiatives, I think, would also really help to keep um, women uh, in the science and provide them equity, not equality, but equity in a way that uh, they get um, a good opportunity to excel in their uh, career too. I would like uh, to add, Elif, that I strongly agree. And in my group, I have a situation that PhD, female PhD students can finish PhD on time because of delivery of the baby. And I was surprised to see that TU Delft doesn't have a policy to support them to uh, give an extension. That can be done only by the group where the female students, the female candidates uh, work. And I will also expect a kind of policy to support this type of situation. And that is quite normal that this can happen during the PhD research. So we need to have very, very clear policies for this. I agree with you. Yeah. I also want to include male colleagues that go through exactly. some of their difficulties. So we exactly. should not just exclude them because making a family uh, is a group effort. Yeah. Yeah, one of the ideas is also paternal leave. So if, if, a, if, a, if a woman gives birth, that maybe the husband can take time off and take care of the child and that the, 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 the mother can go back to certain center to work maybe. Yeah, so there are many possibilities to be the best in class as a university to support this type of initiatives. And yeah. I guess when we will ask people in the chat to give some examples what can change, we will have a very, very huge list, yeah. <laughs> Thank you everyone. So, um... David, you will see there are a few questions on gender pay gap in, in the chat. Maybe this is one of the figures that would be nice to have in this dashboard that is being developed, just a suggestion. Um, there are some uh, comments on uh, uh, more uh, dimensions of diversity than just gender. So the, the film touched upon the challenges of intersectionality. So being a person of color and a woman uh, in academia. Uh, here we have uh, four female faculty members who are uh, also non-Dutch and working in the <laughs> Dutch uh, academic system. We can uh, probably share some of the uh, additional challenges um, of this um, uh, situation. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that the, the discussion that, that was triggered by, by this film has been so active and interactive and uh, time is already up so i now need to uh, prompt the final statement from all our panelists and then um, give the mic back to astrid and vincent for uh, closing remarks so our dear panelists the final question for you is um, what does an equal or more equal future look like 
for TU Delft, for our students, for uh, for our children? Sam. <laughs> oh boy, I got to go first. <laughs> um, now, I think most important for a more equal culture at TU Delft is that everybody feels at home here and feels the same way. Um, so what, I, what you get a lot from the movie is that women in science feel that, you know, sometimes get the feeling that they don't belong or it's much harder for them to just do their science because they have to deal with other problems as well. And this goes for all diversity in all groups. And I think in the ideal situation, everybody can just do what they want to do without having to worry about any of this. Uh, and I think the key to that, as we discussed a couple of times during this meeting as well, is education. Keep talking about this, keep teaching people about this tell people about this but also for people personally to keep an open mind don't you know don't feel attacked when you make a mistake on this everybody finds this difficult uh, of course it is difficult but be open to other people criticizing you for for making a mistake in that and try to see you know how could i improve on this what could, what what did i do wrong um and i think that's the key to to, to having a more inclusive university thank you sam uh laura I guess that the future um, of equality means that uh, we will not be having these meetings uh, in TU Delft because they are not necessary. But what I dream is um, it's a moment where women are, don't feel judged for everything that they do. Uh, so I, I read into the chat uh, that we may be feel judged because uh, people may believe that uh, somehow they gave us a position to TU Delft because we were women. At the same time, we were discussing about how women may be uh, very mean or very masculine uh, when they are climbing into their careers. When we are so little number of women, at some point we were discussing about the damage that women do within the group. Uh, so I, I perceive this uh, not like the correct way to do it because we are blaming women <laughs> all the time, right? For being uh, too masculine uh, or, you know, uh, they are not enough. So for me, a future of equality is when women can be themselves and they don't feel judged by anything or any actions that they take uh, with respect, uh, in, yeah, uh, related to their gender. Thank you, Laura. Elif, can you go next? Um, for me, the, the future is so diverse that we are colorblind, we are genderblind, and, uh, and we just see people for who they are and what they do, because that's the whole thing. We are, want to contribute to great science, and that's what we should be doing. Um, and act on, um, you know, in order to erase all of this uh, discrimination, we should just act on basic universal needs. What's our motivation when we uh, do something? Just really understand that um, uh, that concept of uh, that everyone is actually operating on those universal needs. And uh, if we recognize that, uh, we will not see color uh, or you know <laughs> ethnicity and it's, or gender, etc. So that's uh, that's the kind of future that I hope uh, to see. Thank you, Elif. Sophia. Maybe the same way as Laura said, that we don't need to have workshops and discussion about the diversity and so on. But I guess that will be very, very long future. And I will say for me that on the short notice to Delft will be really best in class. And I see a question from David uh, asking me, David Ebbing, not Gieson, David Ebbing asking me, what does it mean being best in class? I will say being the best for example, from all three or four technical universities. So have a very, very, very clear uh, strategy how we would like to, uh, uh, to be better than others about the numbers, about the culture, about an atmosphere. Think about this. I will say if we will all together sit one uh, weekend maybe with each other, we can define the, the ways to be best in class, maybe not only between the technical universities in the Netherlands, by all universities. If we will have a very clear strategy and that will be shared by our be, uh, board of directors of board of university, we could be really be 
best in class. And that will change the university, will be make us better because we know that uh, diversity contributes to the, the better res uh, results, but it will also change to some extent the society. So that is my dream, best in class. Thank you very much. And finally, let's hear from our diversity officer what a more equal working and learning environment at TU Delft looks like. Yeah, so I think we have a lot of work to do and we're missing a lot of policy and things. So the first thing we need to do is to tackle, let's say, the more negative parts of diversity that are, that are affecting the quality of our work and the, and the work environment and creating a more inclusive environment and then shifting to a more uh, I hope that we can ship also in the future. I mean, the dream would be that we embrace diversity as something positive and recognize we are a diverse world and diverse cultures. That's not going to disappear. Of course, we share underlying universal values, but we are diverse. And there's a thing called culture and different views, uh, also depending on, on gender and other aspects. Um, different um, religious backgrounds could also provide different perspectives uh, all on ethics and other, other things. So there's many, I think, really exciting things about diversity that we could be looking at, but we first need to tackle the, the tough issues that are really blocking us and get rid of this negative view and move forward. And I, I think I think we could really be best of class in embracing diversity in the future. That's my dream. Thank you, David. And thank you also for opening up the discussion beyond just gender, which is a more obvious uh, obvious element because 50% of the population are women and because it's a visible difference between, between two groups of people, but there are many other uh, dimensions of diversity, religion, um, ethnicity, um, uh, and, and many other things that people don't even think about, like having to take care of a sick relative that can affect uh, one's career in ways that other people don't experience. So um, with this um, uh, uplifting and optimistic uh, view on a more equal future uh, for, for our uh, uh, workplace and for, for science in general, I give the uh, uh, floor back to uh, Astrid and Vincent for uh, some uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Wow, thanks everyone. Uh, Vincent checking in from the library again. Thank you to our panelists and moderator for such an inspiring discussion um, and Astrid for collaborating with me um, to put forth this program. I just wanna say that um, I think this, um, this is just one in a series. This is an ongoing um, event and, and the library is committed to continuing such discussions um, and committed to the issues of diversity and equality on campus. And um, I wanted to encourage everyone to check out um, this, uh, the two exhibitions that are online um, through the Heritage site, heritage.tudelft.nl. Um, one is the, about the history of the uh, freshman fresh woman uh, classes uh, through, throughout the history of the university. And the other one's about um, some very inspiring research, contemporary faculty on campus and their um, inspiring stories to, to motivate and help uh, decrease this uh, leaky pipeline. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Astrid. And I wanted to thank everyone once again for being here today and see you at more events. Um, well, I also would like to thank everybody, the panel members and Valeria for uh, moderating this nice event. And uh, I, I, I agree with Vincent, I, I think this could be a nice starting point uh, for uh, follow up events. But anyway, I would also like to use one minute to uh, bring to uh, attention our uh, networking, pandemic networking event, uh, the coming Monday. Uh, by a female scientist who are new uh, to uh, TU Delft. And also, um, yeah, look uh, on the Davis website for more uh, trainings and events. And I also would uh, really like to bring to the attention our mentoring program, 
So if you are looking for a mentor or if you uh, would like a mentor, please uh, contact us. And uh, thank you everybody for joining. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.